All right, so welcome into our baseball panel. Uh, we're really happy to have uh, the return of Jim Albert from this morning. Thank you so much for your time this morning. It was an excellent uh, workshop in R, baseball in R. We have, uh, uh, so Jim Albert from Bowling Green University, Bowling Green State University. We have Katie Crawl, uh, analyst for the uh, Cincinnati Reds. What's your official title, Katie? A baseball operations analyst for the Reds. Baseball operations analyst for the Reds. And we have uh, Walter King, who I'm told now works for the Raiders. So it's a little bit odd when we're putting the program together to say, okay, we have a Raiders, uh, a Raiders uh, analyst that's on the baseball panel, but uh, formerly of the, what were they at that time? Which, which angels? There's so many different names. It's hard. Uh, I think by my first year, they had officially become the Los Angeles angels. They dropped the of Anaheim. Okay. So they weren't the Anaheim or California or, but the, the Los Angeles angels. So um, we will keep an eye out for Keith Warner of the Cleveland Indians. I'm assuming that the snafu is probably because of us. Um, we had the mix up with the different, uh, the different Zoom rooms, but we're happy to have everybody here. So let me just uh, start by, uh, we'll kind of do a quick round robin of uh, just about what drew you to baseball and baseball analytics, and also just how you got into, um, like how you got into the business, what made it, what you do in your, in a daily basis. So I'll start with, uh, I'll start with Katie on this. Oh, well, oh, wait, should we even start, stop for one second? Welcome into Keith Warner. Keith, you want to introduce yourself? You're muted. There we go. Better? Uh, hi, I'm Keith Wollner. I'm a data scientist with the Cleveland Indians, uh, where I've been for the past 13 years now. And um, I won't hold things up any longer. <laughs> oh, no, you're fine. I, now, we have to comment, though, Katie. He, he has his background game branding for for his team. I don't know what we're doing here. More team spirit than me. Maybe by the time I get to 13 seasons, I'll have that down. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so again, we're just starting with, um, we'll start with Katie. What, what do you do in your role and what drew you to baseball and baseball analytics? Definitely. And if I may, John, before we dive into that, I'd like to take a moment to uh, recognize Kim Ang, who, as I'm sure most of you know, was named today the first female general manager in Major League Baseball, which is a really historic accomplishment. Uh, I personally owe a great debt to Kim. She hired me to work in the commissioner's office in Major League Baseball. Uh, and I think women everywhere really do. So just wanted to make sure that we acknowledge that because this is this is really significant and I'm excited by what's happening. Very cool. Thank you. Yeah, I saw that when I was out at lunch. As for me, uh, so like John said, I'm a baseball operations analyst for the Reds. Prior to that, I worked for a year and a half in the commissioner's office for Major League Baseball, which was a really cool experience because you get a great macro level sense of the industry. You're tackling questions there like discipline analysis, salary arbitration, rule changes that um, a lot of the other clubs don't consider just because as I'm sure Keith and Walt will attest to, you know, you're focused on winning the game that night when you're with a team. So you have a very short term focus, which is completely justified. Uh, so I really enjoyed having that experience, came over to the Reds in January. And uh, initially I worked pretty exclusively with baseball operations and scouting. And now because of um, some of our recent departures and analytics have assumed more of those responsibilities. Great, we'll move over to Walt. Yeah, so um, when I was with the Angels, my role was uh, more heavily focused on the economic side. So kind of roster building decisions, uh, heavily in arbitration, um, things like uh, tender deadline cuts, uh, rule five roster protections, things like that, both our club and then also, uh, you know, making predictions on teams across the league. So things like that. Um, and then with my move to the Raiders, I focused more on the development side. So working on, um, you know, data architecture and availability. So, I mean, as far as getting into baseball in the first place, um, you know, I was kind of drawn to the kind of accounting nature of the stats of the game and how accessible it was on the public side. So it kind of, you know, cultivated an interest from a young age and, you know, made things easy to work with and really get into early on. Great. I'll go to Keith next. Uh, yeah, so I was interested in baseball from a very young age and actually first became uh, aware of the 
uh, baseball statistical or sabermetric uh, ideas in the late 80s and early 90s uh, with the Usenet news group Rexport Baseball, kind of a precursor to a lot of the web discussion forums that exist today. And that was for a long time kind of the center of the hub of the online baseball uh, 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 thinking and, uh, and development. From that group, uh, there were a group of people who started Baseball Prospectus in the mid-90s. And I was not part of the original group, but I was, I think, the first one to join the group after the original uh, five. So I actually have a copy of the very first uh, self-published edition of Baseball Prospectus in 1996, which was a terrible, terrible book. Um, there were several pages that went uh, suddenly and were printed in like some Cyrillic font instead of English, and it was completely missing the St. Louis Cardinals chapter. So they've come a long way since then, and I like to think I had a little something to do with that. I was with uh, Prospectus for about 10 years doing uh, baseball uh, research in a variety of areas, uh, probably most notably in the concept of replacement level and what later became uh, VORP and uh, WAR, or kind of uh, cousins in that space. And in 2007, I had the opportunity to come join the Indians as the first person in the baseball analytics group uh, here. So I kind of have uh, built the group up uh, around me and my, Responsibilities over time have changed. I worked on very uh, you know, pretty a little bit of everything early on because as a single person department, you that's what you did. Uh, as you grow the group, you get to focus uh, and and tailor things to your specific uh, talents and what the the resources within the group are. So while I've worked on everything from economics to uh, in-game decisions. Uh, most of the stuff has been at the at a player acquisition level or valuation. And uh, most recently, I've been focusing more on the systems and backend side, uh, dealing with a lot of the StatCast data and figuring out how we can sort of wrap our hands around, you know, orders of magnitude more data than existed when I first got into this a couple decades ago. I mean, from a, from a Reds fan perspective, I'm sure that uh, the world would be a better place if we could forget about the St. Louis Cardinals sometimes. So uh, <laughs> maybe, uh, sorry for anybody from Missouri on here, but uh, uh, let me uh, go to Jim on this. And, and Jim, you have a different perspective. I mean, we have Katie, Walt, and Keith, who, uh, while they have done some research outside of the game, uh, have all worked directly for a team. But for your work as a researcher, uh, how did what, well, first, what you got you into that and where do your interests lie in that area? Well, of course, I grew up like a lot of us, you know, I grew up liking um, baseball and sports. Uh, I still play a lot of tennis and so I'm still, I like that. And so playing simulation games, I was always interested in data. And so I was pretty strong in math. And then so I went on and got a PhD in statistics. And honestly, at that time, publishing papers about sports wasn't probably the best track to tenure. <laughs> So I uh, went through the, you know, I did the usual things. And then once I was tenured, I said, well, what do I really want to work on? And I was more, I mean, I knew sports so well that you could, what was fun about doing statistical stuff is you really could make sense of what you learn. So it was really, um, you know, it was sort of, you need, whenever you do a statistician, you have to, you have to figure out what area or what applied area you're, you're in. And you're typically consulting, but the nice thing about my things, I knew baseball well enough so I could, sort of make sense of what I was working on. I also have an emphasis, I always have an education focus. I think this is a wonderful way to get people excited about math and statistics and data, now data science. I mean, I think um, there's an opportunity here you know, with all the data available. So I like, you know, I, to me, I'm trying to encourage or get people at all levels you know, interested in that. Absolutely, when it comes to like with your workshop earlier today, um, I found that with my students, Putting something that they're interested in and always makes it so much easier to teach. Um, I like to say that if you, I like to have my students learn without them realizing they're learning. That's this is really a, a nice way to do that. They they learn so much with without the standard academic pursuit that we're used to. Um, for the uh, let's go back to Keith. Uh, you talked about being a one man department at times. So when you're working you're working on that day to day. So you got to kind of pump things out to get ready for the next game. And with baseball, we have plenty of games that we have to, to worry about. Um, 
when do you have time to work on a side project? I'm sure there's not the, not nearly as much time as you'd like, but when do you have time to do it? And when you do, where do you get the ideas for them? Do you come up with them or do the coaches provide them or outside research? It, it can vary. Sometimes it's prompted by a discussion you've had with someone else in the front office or a coach, or it's something that was triggered by an article or even something an announcer said on TV. Uh, very often the, the side projects are uh, fun and interesting, but don't always lead to something that uh, leads to better decision making on the, the team or anything that you're going to implement. But uh, those can often be one thing that I found as the group has grown and we brought more people in is that you get a lot of people who are very interested in the analytical side but don't have the skills in SQL or R or anything yet. And taking some of those side projects and a lot and mentoring other people who are trying to develop their analytical skills and give them something which is related to baseball or related to what's going on, but is not a critical path item to um, to you know tonight's game or something like that, is often a good way to help uh, develop the, the skill set you know, more widely in the front office to be able to do these kind of things. That, that's a nice segue to Walt. I remember that you did a uh, a poster at Sloan. Is that correct? Yeah, I pre uh, presented a poster at the 2016 conference. So back in the day when we could have conferences in person. Uh, but so you you worked on a side project, um, you know, as a student. How did that kind of get? Did you feel that, that was a good springboard to get into the industry? Uh, and if so. You know, how do you go from running a project on your own to getting the name out there at the, at the next step? Is it from mark from marketing yourself, networking? How does that go? Sure. So, um, yeah, definitely, it was um, it was something that I kind of took up in my free time, and you know, I would have done it regardless of whether or not it turned into a research poster. You know, it was something I'd really love to do. Um, but as far as getting into the industry, yeah, I mean, it, it definitely helped. Um, and, you know, the, the turning point was really when I uh, got in touch with Dr. Logan in the economics department. And, um, you know, he really kind of helped me develop that as a research project and get it more into a, you know, formal structure that it could be presented um, in a better way. So that definitely helped. Um, and then once you're, uh, once you're in with a team, you know, it kind of is an extension of the same thing, you know, it kind of you know, you have your own curiosity and, you know, kind of pursue things that you're interested in from there. Do you find a difference in what you're doing now with the Raiders? I mean, I guess you said it was more on field or player personnel versus development, but with the, with football versus baseball, is there a, a big divide in the way that things are being done? Um, Sort of. Uh, baseball is a more mature industry, definitely, as far as what's out there, both publicly and uh, internally. Um, so there's less less to draw from. So a lot of the ideas that I kind of explore within football are things that are kind of more established in baseball, like not necessarily like the same type of metrics, but the same type of principles, like, you know, what's predictive, what's reliable, what can we use to tell us more about, you know, who players are and who we think they're going to be. So it's interesting from a, I, I hate to call it a growing industry, but it, it it's a, like you said, I think maturity is the right word in terms of the difference in the levels of maturity. So Katie, uh, for you, uh, you've worked in the commissioner's office and at the team level. How do the, how do the roles differ between those and the ability like to do those more fun side projects that you, the, the curiosity type projects that come up? It's a great question. I am um, kind of pleased by what Keith said about how you can sometimes have a project that doesn't necessarily lead to a change in decision making, which can be a bit frustrating. Um, over the summer, I worked on a project. Uh, I won't disclose the nature of it, but everybody thought it was great. They were like, oh my gosh, Katie, like your findings here are awesome. And then at the trade deadline, we ended up um, making a decision that was completely at odds with the findings of my project, which is, you know, obviously I respect and understand the decision, but at the time was a little bit difficult to swallow. I will say that um, at the commissioner's office, at the initiatives that I worked on, whether that was um, helping negotiate for the next uh, minor league agreement, the PBA, 
or salary arbitration, I would say most of what I produced was then used. Um, at the Reds, I would say it's probably more like 70-30. So that would be one of the main differences that I've noticed thus far. Great, and that, I see a question here from Aiden in the chat, and I think this is a good one for Jim, uh, because you've had a lot of experience with students that are trying to work on projects. And one of the toughest parts is, you know, I tell my students, you got to find something you're passionate about, but then they find this really passionate about baseball, but that's a very general topic. So how do you get, how do you kind of curate projects to get an idea where you're saying, how am I, what, what do I want to do? How do I get data? Where do I start and finish? Well, I think you need an idea. I mean, and I think, uh, for example, I had a student who wanted to do a master's thesis and uh, she had a, her dad and her dad always told her, look out for the first pitch. He emphasized the importance of the first pitch. So she decided to focus her whole study on the impact of the first pitch in baseball. So to me, you just need to start with an interesting question. Now, the question may not lead to the, your final project, but it gets you searching for something and that may lead to other things. See, I think the reason why Bill James is so, is so influential is he came up with really good questions. And I think uh, in really that drives everything else. I mean, and I think, um, and I obviously I, I have not worked for a team, but what I have heard for, is that teams want to hear about these little projects because they show your ability to think up good questions, to do the work, but also communicate what you've learned. And I think um, often students are, to me, they're, they almost like to do the stats, but they don't really, they're not really strong in kind of explaining or trying to make sense of what they've done. So I think, uh, you know, projects are where you get to do everything. And so we try to get our students to present when it, when chance, I mean, you can, in terms of publishing, it could be a paper, it could be a thesis, it could be a blog post. I mean, there are many ways of, of putting it out there. You know, it doesn't need to be a referee publication per se, but at least, you know, it really starts with a good question. And and as, a, as an advisor, I just try to help them along the way. You know, I'm not gonna, I don't wanna think of, of ideas for them to start on, but once they get into something, then I'm happy to provide guidance. And I jump in there with a, a comment yeah. also. Yeah. I think in terms of a, a concrete suggestion for someone who is trying to get started, I see the question asked about like, where do I get the data? How do I get started and stuff? The, uh, a great resource if you're interested in baseball is to buy Jim's book, uh, which he co-authored with uh, Max Marchi, who is uh, now an analyst with the Indians, one of my coworkers. It is called Analyzing Baseball Data with R, and it will take you through where a lot of free uh, data is available online and what the tools are and takes you through sort of the fundamentals of a lot of different aspects of baseball analysis. So you see not only what the concepts are, but also how to implement them yourself so that you understand the language. So uh, he was too modest to, to plug his own book, but I'll do it for him. Okay, <laughs> thanks Keith. I have to agree with Keith there. I was looking around my office and now I'm finding, and I've been in the professor life too long because I'm looking around to find the book that I have in here somewhere, I just can't find it. So. Um, no, I definitely would, would agree with that. Um, for uh, Katie and Keith, I think primarily, and actually this goes for everybody, because I want to build off what, Jane, uh, what Jim had said, was, you know, that we, we get, we're getting better and better and better. And, and I think this is a general analytics question. We're getting better and better and better at these statistical techniques. And that, we're not great, but there's a, a lot of, uh, of resources to improve on that. One thing that I've noticed with a lot of students in particular, but I would assume in your applicants, that I would guess that these, the level of statistics and analytics has gone up, but I'm not convinced about the level of presentation. And that's something that I think, I, I try to convey how important that is, um, you know, how you communicate your results to a lay person, to a coach, to somebody else, can be as important or even more important than the work you do. So. For Katie and Keith, when you're looking at people to join your group, um, it, where do you weight that presentation ability, whether it's speaking or uh, writing? I'll let either one of you jump in. Uh, go ahead, Katie. <laughs> All right. Um, it is definitely something we look for. You can have the greatest 
ideas and do fantastic work, but if you can't convince anyone around you of the quality of what you've done, then no one's going to buy into it. Um, it doesn't exist in a vacuum. You have to be able to understand the perspective of other people in the front office who don't have the training in mathematics or statistical methods that you have and bring them along on showing them the insights that you've been able to discover. And the better that you can uh, present that, whether that's in spoken form or by writing it down, doing data visualizations, all of those things are what you need to be able to do in order to make an actual impact in a, in a front office to get de decisions made differently or with a different uh, piece of input that, that you are able to provide because um, you, it's, it doesn't do you any good to have the right answer and no one listen to you. I completely agree with everything that Keith said. Those presentation skills are so critical. Uh, ben Lindbergh wrote a really great book called uh, The Only Rule Is It Has to Work. And in it, he documents, and I've spoken to him about it, how intimidated he was to speak to players. Even though they had really interesting analysis um, and it was like indie league ball, I think it was like the Sonoma Stompers, he felt really uncomfortable talking to players. Um, and so for me, like if I'm reviewing resumes or speaking to a candidate, I really like to see that someone's worked with a college baseball team, with the Cape Cod Baseball League, um, to know that they've had those interactions with players and coaches and that they feel comfortable sharing their findings because that, as Keith said, is absolutely crucial. Great, thank you. Um, Walt, did you have any interact? What was your role? Your role was was it an intern? I think is what I saw, or did you have a position uh, after your internship with the Angels? Uh, I started as an intern in, uh, for the 2016 season, and then uh, spent two years as um, baseball operations assistant. It's kind of the general catch-all role for people who are starting out in baseball ops. Um, did you have contact then, with players or coaches, or who's your your contact that you were with? Uh, primarily working under our two assistant uh, general managers who were uh, Jonathan Strangio and Steve Martone. Um, my only interaction with the players was when I had to bring them um, paperwork for um, optional assignments and recalls. <laughs> sure, they love that. <laughs> but uh, no, that's great. Um, I, I love to hear the different the different paths and, and the presentation aspect is just monstrous for anyone here. So I want to move to a question. I got a couple of the chat that I'm going to hit on and kind of got it in my in my sites, but I want to move to so a couple more baseball specific questions. And I think th this has been a great intro on like getting into the industry, but let's move a little bit to some of the game. Uh, one of my questions is, I mean, we all know that we moved to this hitting for power type generation. Like this is what the analytics have said, the sabermetrics have really pushed on power, home runs, and there's been some suggestions that maybe for some people, um, I might be one of those people that sits on my porch and tells the kids to get off my lawn, that the uh, home runs, it, it kind of hurts a little bit of the aesthetic of the game when there's more strikeouts, uh, fewer balls in play. Uh, what are your opinions on this? And if, if you agree with it, what changes would you make to alleviate it? Or maybe it's just not something that you're interested in changing. Let's start with, um, I'll start with Katie. Okay, I could probably fill a lot of time with this, but I'll try to keep my comments short. Uh, first of all, from the aspect of how I do my job, I take the rules as a given and I try to figure out what the optimal strategy within, within the context of the rules as they are set up. So if they ban the shift, then we will try to still optimize our defensive positioning, but with within the restrictions of, of whatever it says, you can't have three fielders on one side of the field or whatever. Um, so, you know, from, a, from a, an analyst, for, from a team perspective, um, you don't really focus on the aesthetics of what the game is on the field because what you are uh, incentivized to do is to maximize wins and the chance that you, you win the World Series. Uh, I think that you know, separate from that, if you start brainstorming about ways that you could uh, could change uh, the game, maybe to de-emphasize launch angle and home runs and stuff, I tend to not think about small incremental changes. I try to think of big things that scare people that I don't actually expect will be changed. 
but to kind of expand the palette of, of, of what people are, are talking about. So what if home runs were just treated as doubles? What, uh, you know, what if a, um, what if you didn't get foul tips as strike, as uh, not being a strikeout, you know, so continuing to, to strike foul? Um, what if uh, walks advance base runners? How does that change the, the strategy? How does that change the incentives, the value of the different events that you could have? Again, I don't expect any of these to happen, but I think that it provides a framework for thinking about what are the kinds of outcomes that we want to see in a game or from a plate appearance, and how would you create an incentive so that the optimal strategy or the approach that people were going to take within the game to try to win games within that context leads you to the um, the, the type of game that you want to see. Thanks, Keith. We'll go to Katie. I really like some of those suggestions, Keith. Maybe when you're commissioner someday, you can institute them. <laughs> uh, I actually uh, spent a bit of time considering this when I worked for the commissioner's office because my boss, Chris Young, who some of you may recognize the name. Uh, he pitched for the Mets, the Royals, fantastic person, really bright. Uh, his solution was moving back the pitching mound. And so we conducted a feasibility assessment about the potential for that. Um, and the argument that I made throughout is uh, a lot of things in baseball are arbitrary. So 60 feet, six inches was laid down without a lot of um, you know geometric rationale. It's not in the middle of the diamond. It's like slightly closer to second base. and. So his argument was that if you move back the pitching mound, obviously like velocity would decrease, spin wouldn't be as vicious. So there's one camp that thinks that's a solution. I know there are people who think if you alter the strike zone, that will lead to um, a change. I think the overall question that you need to answer is, as you mentioned, John, like the entertainment value of the game, and then also the balance of power between hitters and pitchers. And you would hope for parity, right? Because the dynamic really should be equitable in a perfect world. Great. Uh, Walt, do you have any ideas on that? And if it's not on the these power component necessarily, just any rules that you may change, want to change if you could do it again? Yeah, I think Katie nailed it. It's really about um, the balance of power between hitters and pitchers. Um, you know, 10 years ago, people were talking about um, how poor the run scoring environment was, you know, and pitchers had the advantage. And then, you know, that's kind of shifted as teams have focused more on home runs and guaranteed runs rather than trying to string together multiple events. Um, as far as ideas, like I think moving back the mound, you know, something that's happened in the past is changing the height of the mound potentially could alter things. Um, and then also like maybe the rules regarding dimensions of the bats, like let guys get up there with bigger bats and increase the rate of contact maybe. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Jim, do you have any insight onto that? Well, the, the Major League Baseball is trying to change the rules a little bit. I thought that one thing that was exciting was the um, the second base and extra innings, starting off with the runner in second base. To me, that was interesting. Now, I thought when that happened that teams would start to sacrifice more. <laughs> but as it turned out, they didn't. They just waited till the home runs. Instead of scoring one run, they would score two runs. So I, it is very interesting. I think, I think baseball needs to be bolder in terms of what they want to do. I mean, just uh, putting up your four fingers for get, taking take, putting something in the second on the intentional walk that hardly impacts the length of the game so one I mean I think the length of the game is a concern I think they should really do some significant things like a pitch clock to really narrow it down because some of the World Series games were were like four and a half hours right I mean they were ridiculous so I think that's got to change I think to bring the game back is more a better entertainment value or better thing to watch I think they need to make some changes and so I think that also brings together that, uh, I think Katie mentioned it, it's, it's the, and Keith mentioned it too, is saying that as a, as a team, you have one objective, and that's to win the game within the rules. So if the, if the best strategy is to, you know, hit as many home runs as possible, then who cares what it looks like? We want to win the World Series. And um, the commissioner's office is going to be looking at both equitable play and entertainment value. And while home runs are very entertaining, um, you know, there, there's that balance of the less so entertaining of uh, the less entertaining strikeouts and walks and how to balance that. So I think there's some interesting approaches and, and actually some of the, I'm not sure about the person on second rule, but I think some of those 
more off the off the beaten path type suggestions are thrown out there as ideas. And I think that we, we look at them and they're worth at least given given credence to and seeing what we can do with them. Um, I, one of the things, and, and maybe if, if anyone wants to weigh in on this, I've always thought that one of the biggest pushbacks of rule change, like big rule changes like Keith is mentioning, has been that baseball to me is a, is a numbers sport. It's been about numbers and historic numbers. If you ask people, you know, up until a few years ago, you know, Roger Maris's home run in a season record, they, they know the number. If you say, what's Babe Ruth's home run number? They know the number. And we talk about changing from 162 games. Well, that changes those numbers, like those, the relevance of the numbers. Uh, whereas if I ask, you know, most touchdown passes in a season, not as many people know that. Does anyone think that have any insight into how the historic record keeping of the game is is uh, one of the reasons that it kind of restricts the rules or do you not agree with that? All right, I'll go. Um, I certainly a lot of the appeal for baseball as a cultural institution is the longevity and the history and the the to a certain degree the the numbers in the game and if you take it as a whole and this is something that has been pretty successful as a professional sport for almost 150 years you can understand that you might be a re little reluctant to make radical changes based on what might be just a, a short-term problem um, the trick is figuring out what is the short-term uh, blip of a phenomenon that uh, will be adjusted to and what re represents a fundamental shift in how the game is played such that you need to adapt to that. Um, and so I think what you see in baseball is a very conservative approach to doing that. Um, but I, you know, given where the, the, the cultural value of baseball has been in the past, that's not necessarily a bad thing. I can agree with that. I want to, I want to get to, we have a lot of good questions in the chat and most of them kind of are questions that we had talked about beforehand. So I'm going to hit a couple of those and then I'll go directly to the chat question specifically. Um, the reason I'm going to go, I'm going to, the only reason I'm going to this question first is it's something that I've always wondered, and it segues a little bit from the power hitting, is uh, with the shift. Um, my, I've always, my animal brain, I guess, has always wondered why we don't train, uh, why players don't hit out of the shift, bunt out of the shift, even power hitters. Um, my idea is if you have somebody that's a heavy pull hitter, if they bunt, not because you're, you're not bunting for that one at bat, you're bunting for breaking the ship, break the threat. But I'm wondering, is the reason for that that they just can't bunt? Or is it just, look, it's just worthwhile and that home run is worth so much, let's stick to it. And it's, I think the question was asked in the chat about uh, bunting out of the ship, especially for left-handed hitters. So um, Walt, do you have any ideas on that? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the first thing I'd say that bunting is a lot harder than it looks. Um, you know, and there's a pretty, it's, it's, it's a pretty low upside play. Like, you know, there, it's only going to result in a single most likely. So if, I mean, if it works 40% of the time, it's what an 800 OPS. So, you know, that's a lot lower than some guys are able to put up on their own. Plus like if you fail, then, you know, you're just adding a strike and that really decreases your chance of succeeding in the at bat. So, you know, I think it's easier said than done. Yeah. The bunting aspect, I know it's, from little league to the professionals is a different, uh, different game entirely. So, uh, Katie, what do you think about that? I completely agree with Walt. It's a lot harder than it looks, and it's one of those things like in golf, like the two foot putts. Like nobody likes practicing bunting. Nobody likes sacrificing a part of their BP round to you know lay down bunts. And if they do it, it's like very lackadaisical. It's um, they don't put a lot of energy and thought to it. I will say like Keith mentioned too, like there have been people who have said like ban the shifts and you'll solve all the problems in baseball. I know Derek Jeter is of this mindset. So I'll be curious to see how the rules evolve over the next few years, um, especially as we have the new CBA coming up. 
I'm going to move to another question here because this is made in the chat, but actually Katie was talking about this question before is um, in 10 years, what are we going, what innovations are we going to be talking about with regard to injury prevention? Um, is it, or is, what are we, what innovations are we talking about? Will it be injury prevention, player evaluation from international players, building a front office and culture? What are those areas that you think are the real front lines right now for the next, next generation? Jim, do you have any insight into that? Or is that more of a question for the uh, people that are on teams? Well, I, I, in terms of, I mean, in terms of analytics, I think there's a lot of things that we really don't know much about. For example, teamwork or somehow the chemistry, we don't understand exactly. We hear a lot about the ability of players to work together, but we haven't measured it very well. I mean, I think um, you know, everything we do nowadays is sort of assuming that we like got, that's got individual players. I mean, it'd be nice to get a better sense. I mean, I know in basketball, team play is such an important aspect of scoring. But I don't think we've really got a handle on exactly what that means from a baseball perspective of the actual, of, of working together. Uh, Keith? One of the first big articles that I wrote for Baseball Prospectus uh, appeared, I think, in 2000 or 2001. And it was looking at injury prevention with pitchers and specifically looking at pitch counts and is there any trend there? And that's part of the reason that pitch counts have come down a lot from what you saw in the 90s and earlier. Uh, when I first started with the Indians, um, there was a, a big focus on, you know, can we do something to prevent injuries? And there wasn't a lot of data at the time, um, but there was a real big interest in doing that because if you look at how much money is you know being spent on players who are on the dl or the uh, injured list now um at any time it's you know it's it's a large percentage of of what you're allocating for payroll so i think that a big frontier right now continues to be injury prevention and how to keep players healthy and optimized on the field i think that the data has become much more available in terms of teams are investing a lot more in biomechanical analysis and uh, uh, sports science and a lot of the, the tools that are being developed that didn't exist 10, 15 years ago to be able to investigate it further. But I think this will always be a, an area of challenge and something that we're never quite happy with how much progress we've made. So I think in 10 years, it will still be injury prevention is something that we're talking about and looking to improve on. Uh, Katie? Jim and Keith are spot on. I think both culture and injury prevention are two holy grails that we're all seeking. To add some variety, I would say um, quantitative player evaluation in the international market in particular is still another frontier that I think has a lot of um, room for improvement. I think that um, all data that's like coming in now, like you're able to put Rapsodos um, or even Trackmans at some like DSL facility. So that's really interesting. Personally, I think that a lot more could be done to evaluate like the physicality of players. So you can take like height and weight measurements, but a kid who's like 5'11", 180 pounds, who hasn't had proper nutrition his whole life could look very different. And I think if we do a better job of um, capturing that information, maybe it's grip strength, maybe it's, you know, foot size and trying to piece together a picture of what's this player going to look like when he comes to the States, I think we're going to have a much better pipeline of talent coming from Latin America. Walt, do you have any insight into that? Yeah, I think um, Katie had a really good point there about the physical aspect of the game and, um, you know, what translates to, you know, on-field success. Like, how can a guy like Mookie Betts, who's relatively small, put up, you know, similar power numbers to John Carlos Stanton? So understanding that aspect of it, I think, would be a big uh, area for teams to improve their understanding. Great. I got a question here in the chat about um... – uh, more pertinent for Keith and Katie uh, regarding Trevor Bauer and uh, future, current and future red, we were all hoping. So um, so it says uh, basically about his analytic approach with what he's done. It, the question was, have you learned anything from him or have you expressed your ideas to him uh, in terms of learning from a player side who's kind of trying to utilize the analytics? Um, how do you 
what have you learned from him and how does he learn from you guys or that type of player? Katie? I was gonna let Keith go first because Trevor was with the Indians before us. <laughs> um, I will say Trevor is an exceptionally, um, he's a critical thinker. So he was a, an engineer at UCLA. He's very intentional about how he goes about his work. And I think that we would all say that because of him, you know, baseball has changed for the better. I think that he and Kyle Bodie have definitely spearheaded a lot of new initiatives that five or six years ago were considered like heresy that are now pretty commonly accepted, whether that's with like weighted ball training or long toss. Um, I think in terms of how we've interacted together, we've had very positive interactions. Uh, he's been very hungry for biomechanical data. That's something that he's really interested in. Um, and so I think because of that, our coaching staff has worked really hard along with our analytics department to provide him with that information. Yeah, I was being quiet because I didn't actually interact with Trevor a whole lot in his time with the Indians. He was here for a while and I know other people in the, the front office um, uh, engaged with him and you're right he has a you know a unique combination of an engineering you know personality predisposition combined with the physical talent to play at the highest levels of the game and be one of the best uh, at baseball and so when you combine that and the insight into what it means from a player perspective and be able to execute on some of the ideas or some of the the things what can you actually get a player whose arm motion is in a certain way uh, you know, can he really change that or do you have to work within certain physical constraints that maybe are showing up in the biomechanics? So while I don't have a, a personal anecdote to share on that, I think that as we see more players who have, have grown up with the combination of uh, the analytical approach in the game and that are also starting to perform on the field, I think you're going to see more Trevor Bauer types in their approach to, to making themselves better. The question I see here that's interesting is about base running. And do you think that base running can be further optimized with, with more detailed information? And so how, um, what, what are the aspects that you would be looking at if you can talk about it uh, that you would think about with running the bases? Walt, do you have anything on that topic? Uh, yeah, I can hop in. Um, so. One of the things that we found was that um, base runners could afford to be a lot more aggressive when advancing, um, especially when the ball's still in the outfield. Like we found that um, we were being a little too conservative with sending guys first to third or trying to score from second. Um, and there was a big opportunity to improve in that area. Uh, I think, you know, most teams re recognize now that, you know, the value of stolen bases is kind of limited, especially considering how often guys fail at that. But advancing on balls in play more is a good way to better optimize base running. Any other insights into base running? Yeah, I think that one thing you have to think about when you're designing a strategy um, for base running is what information can a player who was going from first to third actually see and process instantaneously to make that decision. You know, it may be something where you can look at all the stat cast data and figure out that, oh, the nearest outfielder is 18 feet from the ball. And so given that the runner has this speed, he has a 66% chance of being able to make it a third safely. That's not information that can be perceived at the time the base runner is making the decision about whether to, to go to, to from second to third. Um, so it's great to have those uh, analyses done so you can figure out that on the whole, we are being too uh, passive and not being aggressive enough, like uh, like Walt was saying. But um, to turn it into a practical, executable strategy, you have to think about what is the limited or the the uh, amount of information. What rules of thumb can a player quickly make a decision about in order to make that turn? And then the other thing I would say is that I would optimize base running by reducing the number of hamstring pulls and people trying to get down the line to first, which again relates to injury prevention, my previous answer. And Katie, regarding that, this is again, the little league approach. You know, I was, we were always taught, you know, don't, don't look at the ball, look at your base coach. Do they do that at all in the pros? I know they don't, but is there any push to make them watch the base coaches or, or not so much? I think we try to give players as much autonomy at the Reds as possible. That pretty much extends philosophically from how we um, present analytics to them 
to, uh, you know, like their own strength and conditioning training. With that being said, just in terms of the topic of quantifying base running, like it's something that's on our scouting reports, right? Like I can look at a player and pretty much tell you if he's a good or a bad base runner. So I do think that it is feasible someday to assign like a real number that you can justify to his ability. Great. Well, I've, I've, we were wrapping up here. I have one more question that's just in general and whether it's baseball or not baseball analytics. And I'll start with Jim with this. Uh, one of the questions in the chat says, what are some of the biggest mistakes you've seen from people within data analytics? Um, that can be from a baseball side or not. What are some of those uh, errors that come up and how to avoid those? Well, I mean, um, it's interesting because the thing that bothers me most, the more the, more the statistical things that people say about things, like they'll talk a lot about, um, they'll use, of course, they'll just say small sample sizes, but they go ahead and draw some conclusion based on a small sample. And um, so we like to hear about, we love to hear about clutch ability. We love to hear about um, you're hot or you're cold, right? And I think um, that's gonna continue. I think anything we can do to try to get away from those mindsets that realize that some things we should even bother measuring because they're just not, it's like um, flipping a coin. <laughs> it's not really very meaningful data, but we collect it because we we think it's, it's interesting. Like. Um, you know, people are in slumps or, you know, um, and I think, I don't know how we're to get away from that, but um, so I, I work those, those kind of things. I think people probably make a lot of, what was the example? Oh, the example was the um, the pitching, uh, the person taken out of the game, right? That um, that pitcher who had a great, uh, who was this? A World Series game, right? Where the guy had a great pitching performance, but he was supposedly, he only couldn't pitch more than, what, five innings? So he was taken out after letting up a single in the sixth, right, in the World Series game. And um, again, I'm disappointed that maybe analytics was a little too relied on and they weren't really looking at how the, how the pitcher was actually doing during the game. So I think how to use your, how to combine analytics with your, like your personal observation is still going to be a challenge. I'll right. Does anyone have any other, any, oh yeah, go ahead, Keith. Yeah, I've, um, I've had the opportunity to be a judge in a lot of um, uh, sports analysis competitions or business case competitions. And that usually consists of a, a short presentation where people are trying to highlight the, the results. And a lot of those people are looking, you know, hopefully to move into a job in baseball. And uh, just a plug on the side, we expect to be posting a couple of jobs in the near future. Watch fan graphs or your favorite baseball blog for info on that. But the two things that I see most often that uh, are mistakes, one is an unreasonable focus on precision that on their slide with their example, they've got 12 digits after the decimal point. And, you know, you're at a point where it's like, okay, well, you've got the pitch movement down to like the proton level. And that's just not, you know, credible. And that's not relevant to the point that they're trying to make. The other thing is that so a lot of times I'll see a, a, a presentation where they get an answer and they put it up there and they say, this is worth, you know, 60 runs a year. And it doesn't pass the sniff test. You have to think about if, if this effect was really as large as you're saying, would it have manifested itself in some other way? And so just to be able to sanity check, to know the domain that you're in, to know the game of baseball enough so that if you get an unreasonable example, you catch it in time um, so that you can say, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. Use your, use your priors on what the, the size of this is and make sure that you go back and can really justify it before you put it in front of a potential decision maker. All right, well, I think um, we are pretty much out of time here. So I wanna thank, thank the panelists for their time. We really appreciate your insight. Like I said, the best part about this is the diversity of, of thought we have here from the, from the team perspective, the commissioner perspective, someone who's worked in multiple sports and then from an academic researcher perspective. So thank you so much for your time.